Hello students and welcome to Exploring the Bible. I'm your professor, Dr. Matthew Umberger, and uh, in this first module we'll have an introduction to scripture as well as taking the opportunity just to kind of go over the nuts and bolts of the class. Uh, let's start with that. Um, if you look on Blackboard, you will find the syllabus um, under information. Just a couple things I want to go over with, with you. Um, first of all, required texts. Uh, first of all, since this is a course on scripture, you probably ought to have a Bible. And I don't really care what kind of translation you have. Um, you can, uh, the bookstore recommends the New American Bible. Uh, that's what is in there that you can buy. Um, personally, I have some problems with the New American Bible. Some of these will come up as we uh, get through the class, as we lecture. But um, it, it's an okay translation. Um, the best thing is to have multiple translations. And, and um, uh, since this is an online course, uh, maybe we'll have opportunity in some of the Blackboard discussions to do some dis some. Um, a dialogue about the different kinds of translations, how different passages are translated from uh, translation to translation. Um, the best kind of translation for you to have is the one that you will use. Uh, so get one probably that's not too old, not using um, archaic language. King James Version is a beautiful translation, but it's one that's hard for many people today to make to get much good out of because it uses Elizabethan English. And so uh, probably getting a modern translation is the best thing to do. Um, something that you can understand that you'll read and really get into. Um, my personal favorite is the Revised Standard Version. Um, I use the Catholic edition, but uh, the Revised Standard Version was first done as a Protestant translation. It's a revision of the King James Version. Um, so it's nice because it's one that Catholics and Protestants can use and uh, in, in a way read the same Bible text. Um, so this is my, per my uh, personal favorite, um, but there's so many translations out there. Uh, just pick the one that you, you probably already have one. If you don't, uh, get one that you will read. Maybe ask your friends, family, what, what version they use or uh, the find out what version they use in the church that you go to, and uh, get a Bible that you will read. Um, there are two textbooks. The first of these is Holy People, Holy Land by Michael Dauphinae and Matthew Levering. Um, this is a really nice little book about kind of the, the major salvation narrative of Scripture. Uh, if you're trying to boil the story of the Bible into one narrative, um, this is their uh, attempt to do that. Um, built around holiness, uh, God creating a holy place for his people to become holy in. Um, a really nice little book. I expect you to, to get this, to read this. Um, I don't have this with me right now, uh, but another book that I, would, that I need you to get um, it'll be on the test, is um, the book by Edward Sri called The Bible Compass um, by, from the Ascension Press. Uh, please get a hold of that book, uh, order it on Amazon, uh, make sure that you have it, because uh, some of the, the, te the questions on the midterm will be from that book. Um, there are uh, a number of assignments. Uh, because this is an online course, this means that we have to uh, make up for lack of personal contact, seat time, uh, with some other means, other methods. And, and so there are a lot of assignments for this online course. And um, I would recommend treating this like any other course that you might take, uh, any live course. Don't, don't allow things to uh, be neglected. Stay on top of your work, your reading, and uh, every day tackle a little bit of it. Um, the, the first thing that is due is a midterm exam. Uh, this will be available on Blackboard. Uh, it will be due by midnight. You have two hours to get it completed. Once you start it, you won't be able to back out of it. You just have to keep um, uh, doing it. And uh, there will be uh, 
two hours to finish it, and when you're done uh, with your your blackboards your uh, test, uh, you submit it, and uh, hopefully you you will get it done within the two hours that are allotted. This has to uh, this is due on midnight of July eighth. Um, you'll be uh, you'll have opportunity to complete it before then if you want, uh, but it has to get to me by midnight of July eighth. Um, the next thing that's due is an exegesis paper. I will give you instructions on what I expect with this. Um, this will be due midnight of July 22nd. So you have an exegetical paper. Um, I'll, that's an exegetical. Um, exegetical is just a Greek word. It means to draw out. Uh, it's an interpretation. Uh, so don't get scared by the big word and. Um, I doubt that any of you have ever done an exegetical project before. Don't get intimidated by it. I'll walk you through it. I'll tell you exactly what I want, what I expect. Um, shouldn't be any problem. Um, your, you have a research paper that is due. Uh, this is 20% of your grade. It's due on midnight of July 29th, uh, a week after your exegetical paper. So since this is only an eight-week course, it means everything kind of um, is crammed together. So you really have to be really responsible and keep on top of this to get through all of the work that you're required to do. Um, so uh, again, I'll give some instructions on this research paper. Um, I'm going to give you quite a bit of leeway with this. Um, as long as you pick out a topic that is good and um, has something to do with the material we've covered in this course and um, as long as you have I would say about five serious uh, sources. Uh, when I say serious sources I'm talking about um, sources, uh, hard copy sources uh, or journal sources from the library. Um, I, I, I don't mind if you uh, quote something from pop culture from the internet maybe as an illustration, but that will not qualify as research. So you really have to uh, find good quality academic sources for this research paper uh, or it will count against your grade. And um, this final paper is 20% of your grade, so you really want to do well on this. And um, then you will have a final exam. Uh, it's due on the last day of our class, August 5th, again at midnight. Um, the most important part of this class, though, uh, most of your grade will be um, on your discussion board participation. And so um, every week, by midnight on Saturday, I want to see that you have um, submitted your own response to the prompt, so the discussion prompt that I will give you, and as well that you will respond to at least two other um, statements from your classmates. Now, some of you, you may uh, be an early bird and it might, it might get kind of aggravating waiting for some of your uh, friends, your colleagues to uh, weigh in on something. And um, it, that's one of the limitations of an online course. Uh, but, but do your best, but keep that in mind if you are a procrastinator, uh, you're making it hard for your colleagues in this course to get their work done as well. Uh, so the earlier the better. Uh, listen to the lecture, the video lecture, read the reading, and then respond as soon as possible to the prompt, the discussion prompt, so that you can um, also get feedback from your colleagues. Again, I expect two responses to your classmates in those discussion boards. I've divided you up into four different sections. So let's get with it. Uh, this first lecture I really want to cover what is the Bible and uh, we're going to define some terms. Terms like revelation, inspiration, um, scripture, canon, uh, some of these different words. Uh, first of all, w when we talk about the Bible, what does the Bible mean 
for the Christian people. Uh, Christians of all faiths, and different, uh, so Protestants, Catholics, uh, we all agree that the Bible is God's revelation to his people. And in fact, the Jewish people would agree with this, with us on this, that uh, God has revealed himself through his written word, which is the Bible. What is revelation? So when we say that God has revealed himself, what do we mean? What does a revelation mean? Um, there are different kinds of revelation. Um, so, f first of all, when, when we say that God has revealed himself, we're saying that God, our creator, uh, wants to uh, speak to us and, and show us uh, two things in particular. Uh, he wants to convey to us who he is, what his nature is, and also that he wants to uh, teach us how we are to live. Uh, he wants to, so we have moral teaching. So these are the two major uh, aspects of the content of Revelation. Um, there are different kinds of Revelation. In, in, um, I would say that there are three major ways that God reveals himself to us, reveals himself and his truth to us. Um, the first way that we um, that we encounter revelation is through what is sometimes called natural revelation. Um, natural revelation is uh, the kind of revelation that without any supernatural activity on God's part, without any divine help, uh, just by our own powers of reason, the truths about God and morality that we can kind of figure out through our own natural powers. And um, the truth is, there's quite a bit that we can know about God um, and His truth just by thinking about the world around us, thinking about ourselves, uh, the nature of our own human person. So, for instance, uh, when we look at the world around us, uh, we can reason that there must be a creator. Um, the, I know that there are different perspectives in the world today, uh, but until recently, um, you go back to the Greek philosophers, uh, certainly not uh, people who uh, in, had encountered the Bible. Um, but they, uh, you know, uh, Socrates and uh, Plato and Aristotle, they all reasoned that there was a prime mover who had set everything else into motion. Uh, they, they came to that uh, opinion not by reading some sacred scripture, but by looking at the world around them and reasoning that uh, some uh, supernatural being had ordered the world that they lived in. Uh, you know, when you see a work of art, it uh, suggests that there is an artist who is behind it. Th this is something that we can know uh, without any um, action, supernatural revelation on God's part. Uh, just looking at the works of God in nature uh, suggests to us that there is a God who has created them. Um, and similarly, when we think about our human person, we think about things like the familial relationships that we have, the love and the care and the compassion that we have, uh, and, and how rich those experiences make our life. Uh, it can cause us to reason that these experiences must come from a source. Uh, the love that we experience in our life must come from love itself. Um, so th this is another example. Uh, another, another thing that might cause us to look for a creator is this idea that we have this conscience, consciousness uh, we are aware, we're self-aware. Well, where did this consciousness come from? Um, we have, we all seem to agree about certain matters of right and wrong. Uh, you're not going to find any culture that thinks that it's a good thing to run down little old ladies who are crossing the street with your car. Uh, no one's going to say that that's an, a, something that we would applaud. Well, why do we feel that way? Uh, we don't need God to tell us from Mount Sinai that it's wrong to murder little old ladies. Uh, it, our own, within ourselves, we find this law written on our hearts. And this, again, suggests to us that if there is a law like this, there must be a law giver. So this is natural revelation. 
like I said, we can, we can know quite a bit about God, and we can know quite a bit about what God expects of us, just with our own powers of reason. But we can't know everything. We can't know everything that God wants us to know. And this is why we have the next level of revelation, and this is where we, the Bible comes in. Um, so God is not content just to allow us to reach out for him with our own uh, powers of reason. God reaches back, and he does this through what is called special revelation, or sometimes divine revelation. Special revelation is God revealing all those things that we could not figure out through our own powers of reason. For instance, we can know that there is a creator by looking at creation. We cannot know that this creator is the Holy Trinity. Uh, there's no way that our logic could come up with this. Um, it, it might get into um, certain... You can come up with certain logical arguments for the Trinity, but without um, scripture and sacred tradition leading you to those conclusions, uh, we probably wouldn't get to the idea of a Holy Trinity without revelation. Um, certain aspects of morality, um, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we know that um, it is wrong to murder. Um, we also know that it is wrong to... Um, I, th I think most of us feel that it's wrong to uh, pay back someone uh, more than they have done wrong to you. But um, apart from the Christian faith, uh, you don't find too many people out there, um, including the Greek philosophers, they would say, not only do you have a right to take vengeance upon someone, but some of them would actually say that you have a moral duty to uh, pay back someone for harm that they've done to you. You have a moral duty so that injustice just doesn't abound in the world. Well, when we get to the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells us something quite different. He says that when someone strikes you on the cheek, we are to turn to them the other cheek. Now, I don't believe Jesus is saying that uh, we are not allowed to uh, defend ourselves. I think there are times when there, there might be a time that God calls certain individuals to lay down their arms and, and to suffer violence for the sake of the kingdom. But on, in generally speaking, I, I don't think Jesus is saying, you know, let somebody do whatever they want to you. I, I lay down, let them, let them have their way with you. I don't think this is Jesus' point. But I do think Jesus is saying that uh, when someone attacks you and does great harm to you, and you're tempted to punch back, not, not in an act of self-defense, but in a, a manner of, of giving them what they deserve, which is perfectly natural and in accord with natural law, Jesus says he expects something more from us. He wants us actually to turn the other cheek and to let bygones be bygones, which is a very, very difficult thing. One of the most difficult things that Jesus asked us to do. Uh, we couldn't get to that sort of concept uh, without d divine revelation. Uh, we needed Jesus to tell us this is even better than the natural law. And, and then he actually demonstrates this to us uh, by the cross and the redemption and by the fact that after the resurrection, he doesn't annihilate all of the people who crucified him. Uh, when that was certainly in his power, and, and I would say even within his right. So, um, special revelation goes that extra step. It, it fills in all of the gaps that we couldn't fill in ourselves. Uh, we, we need God's help to know certain things about God and about God's truth. Um, this... Um, content of special revelation. Uh, some of this is conveyed in scripture. Um, the whole of it, according to the Catholic faith, is conveyed in sacred tradition. And something that's different about Catholicism from Protestantism is uh, one of the things that Martin Luther uh, said about uh, the Bible was that it was the only source of authority for the Christian, sola scriptura. The, the Catholic Church has 
and the Orthodox Christians with us as well, they would say that Sola Scriptura is not scriptural, actually. Uh, that um, the Bible is very, very important, and it's even the core of our faith. It's the core of sacred tradition, actually. But it is not the whole of it. So sacred tradition, and by sacred tradition, I'm, I'm not talking about just certain habits that have developed in the church over time. For instance, it used to be tradition in the Latin Rite Catholic Church that if you went to Mass, it would be said in Latin, uh, not in the vernacular tongue. Well, uh, after Vatican II, we changed that tradition. We could do that because that was not a sacred tradition. That wasn't a tradition that we had received from the apostles. Um, traditions that go back to the apostles, though, uh, those cannot be changed. Uh, and uh, as the church progresses through history, she is defining what those things are. Uh, so some of those things, for instance, the Holy Trinity. There's a lot in the New Testament and in the sacred tradition that we receive from the New Testament, uh, if, from the Apostles, that suggests that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. But there's nothing that explicitly said that. We didn't have the philosophical tools to define that as a dogma until really the 4th century. Uh, so it took a while for um, the dogma that was contained in the apostolic tradition from the very beginning, it took a while for that to be defined as dogma. Um, but just because the doctrine of the Holy Trinity became dogma, something that has to be accepted if you are a Catholic, uh, just because that became dogma in 325 at the Council of Nicaea, does not mean that before 325, this was not a teaching of the Church. It, it wasn't that we created a dogma, it's that we defined it. We, we said, no, this is something that we have to believe if we're going to be Christians in the Orthodox and Catholic Church. Okay? Um, some recent dogmas uh, that were defined uh, in 1950, the um, Assumption of Mary into Heaven at the end of her life, this was defined as dogma. Um, but and, and sometimes you'll find critics of the Catholic Church will say, well, before 1950, Catholics didn't believe this. This is something that Pope Pius XII invented. And, and this is just not the case, because uh, I can show you all of these places, including, um, I can show you a literal place, uh, the Tomb of Mary, uh, which was turned into a church by Empress Helena in the 4th century again uh, in Jerusalem. And this church was built to commemorate the Assumption of Mary into Heaven. So at least since the 4th century, the church has celebrated the Assumption of Mary into Heaven. Uh, it just wasn't required as a dogma. It wasn't recognized as a defined dogma until 1950. Um, it didn't have to be defined because most people just accepted it. Uh, the church doesn't define dogmas until it becomes a controversy. So, for instance, uh, going back to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, before 325, um, most people, they, they didn't use the word Trinitas too much. Um, Tertullian seems to be the first one to use the word Trinitas in the early 2nd century. Excuse me, early 3rd century. Um, but um, if you would have asked, I believe, any of the apostles if... Jesus is God, I, I think they would have said yes, and there's a lot of evidence. In fact, uh, John 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was flesh, uh, excuse me, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, speaking about Jesus, who um, was, before he was the human person, Jesus, was the divine Word of God, uh, co-eternal with the Father, and who was, in fact, God himself. Um, so even though John doesn't know the word Trinity, he, he knows the concepts that will flesh, be fleshed out with this term Trinity later. Um, the third kind of revelation is mystical revelation. So sometimes uh, you can encounter God and divine truth outside of the bounds of 
than using your reason in the natural world and outside of the bounds of sacred tradition and scripture, um, just while you're having a moment of prayer. Um, sometimes you encounter God in prayer, and sometimes he even tells you things in your prayer time. Um, this is a real experience, and um, this is something that the church has valued ever since the, she started. The thing about mystical tradition, it, excuse me, mystical revelation, is that it's very powerful, it's very faith-affirming, but it has to always be uh, held subservient to the other kinds of revelation. Uh, you would never build your faith around a mystical experience. It has to be in accord, in harmony, with the other things that we know about God and what He has revealed, both through natural revelation and through His Word. Uh, but it's still a very real form of revelation. And um, a lot of the scriptures uh, were compiled as a response to those early uh, mystical experiences of the Jewish people and later the Christians. So the Bible, returning to that second layer of revelation, the supernatural revelation, uh, the Bible is the core of the sacred tradition in which God has revealed himself, um, even in a verbal manner, through the writings of the prophets and the apostles. Now, what is the Bible? Um, if you've never really read the Bible, and you picked it up, uh, you'll probably feel like this is a very strange book. Uh, because it, it doesn't have a beginning and an end in the way that a novel does. Um, you might, you know, if you're reading through the first five books, and actually on all the way through the um, book of Second Kings, they do follow a pretty tight narrative. And then you start getting into books like uh, the Psalms, for instance, and the Prophets, and the chronolo chronological order of these books gets all mixed up, like which prophet lived when. Uh, the prophets, for example, uh, the books of the prophets are all um, uh, collected and ordered according to their length, the same with the epistles for the most part. When you get to the New Testament, and we'll talk about what's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament in just a bit. You get to the New Testament, and the first four books in the New Testament are the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as you're reading these gospel books, um, you get through Matthew, and you might think that Mark is going to keep telling the story where Matthew leaves off. And that's not the case. You get to Mark, and he goes back to the beginning of Jesus' story, and he tells it again. And then you get to Luke, and he does the same thing. In fact, Luke goes way up before Mark does, and starts with uh, the, uh, the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. And he tells the story again. So this is not like a normal book where you have a clear beginning that leads on through an end. So what is the Bible? The Bible is actually a library. Uh, it's a collection of books. And something that's really important to remember as we start our journey through the Bible together is that when um, the Bible was first collected, it didn't look like this, right? Uh, it, it couldn't have been put between two covers. Uh, it would have actually uh, been a collection of a lot of different scrolls, later uh, what is called a codex. A, co a, a codex, th this is actually a codex, but it wouldn't have been one single codex. It would have been multiple codices, plural of codex, that uh, were stacked together on a shelf, perhaps. Um, so the Bible is not really a book. The Bible is a collection of books. I remember uh, one of the first times I taught this class, um, I had a student come up to me after the, the first class was done, and he said, uh, Dr. Umbarger, you keep talking about books of the Bible, and in the bookstore they only had this one. Um, well, that's that's a really nice illustration of what we're talking about, actually. Uh, the, 
there aren't books. You can't get the Bible part two or something like that. But within the pages of this book, there are books. This is actually a library. It's kind of like an encyclopedia, if you will, um, with multiple volumes compiled between two covers. Okay? There are multiple, multiple authors uh, writing over the space of a, about um, 1,200 years, okay? Um, and uh, writing on three different continents. Um, so you have books written in Europe and Africa, and then uh, most of them would have been written in Israel and Asia. Um, so you, you have all of these different authors who have written different books, and some of the, some of the books in this library are actually written by more than one author as well, and, and we'll talk more about this. Uh, different traditions that have been compiled and put together within um, one particular book. So, um, in fact, the word Bible comes from a Greek word, uh, biblia, which means library. So our, our book our, of the Bible is actually a library. Um, and, and so this is how we, we get the Bible. It's not um, a single book. It's actually a collection of books. Um, how did we get this book? We got it from the church. Um, this is, again, a little matter of contention, uh, but uh, sometimes Catholics and Protestants in particular argue about which came first, the Bible or the Church. Well, um, I'm a Catholic, teaching in a Catholic university, so I'm going to tell you that the Church came first. Uh, the Church, uh, founded by Jesus upon the Apostles, um, first of all, they, they collected the Hebrew Bible, there was already a library, there was already a Bible uh, that the Jewish people <clears throat> were using, which today we call the Old Testament. Um, the Jewish people would not regard this as an Old Testament. It is their Bible. Um, so the Old Testament is a Christian term. We call it the Old Testament because we have a New Testament. Uh, the word testament means covenant. And it comes from a verse in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, 31. Um, he says, uh, well, the Lord says, through the prophet Jeremiah, that he will make a new covenant. So we'll talk about what a covenant is in a little bit, uh, in actually the next module. But he says that, God says, I will make a new covenant with Israel. It will not be like the old one, which they broke, um, but in this covenant... I will um, carve this covenant, the law of, of this covenant, on their hearts. Uh, later, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, Jesus goes back to that passage in Jeremiah, and uh, as he is uh, instituting the Lord's Supper, or the Eucharist, he says to the apostles gathered around that table, um, as he holds the chalice, he says, this is the cup of of the new covenant in my blood. So Jesus recognizes the sacrifice that he will pay on the cross as uh, per the, the covenant sacrifice of this new covenant that is prophesied in the book of Jeremiah. So, roughly speaking, these are the two parts of the Bible. We have the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, which was the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible, before the coming of the Messiah. The New Covenant, the New Testament, is the collection of the books that were compiled after the coming of the Messiah, after the coming of Jesus. Of course, the Jewish people do not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, and so their Bible will not have the New Testament in it. Uh, a Jewish Bible is simply the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament was compiled over the space of about 1,200 years. Okay? The New Testament was compiled over the space of about 60 or 70 years. 
uh, so much shorter time span and consequently it is a much slimmer volume uh, so taking my Bible here you can see the Old Testament is much thicker than the New Testament um, there are 46 books in the Old Testament in the Protestant excuse me in the Catholic Old Testament and 27 in the New um, 73 books altogether um, we believe that these books uh, were uh, written under the action of God's inspiration. So the Holy Spirit, uh, the third person of the Holy Trinity, uh, comes down upon the uh, individual who is writing the scripture, the prophet, or the apostle, or, or someone like this. Um, and as he is writing, the Holy Spirit is guiding his writing so that what he says is true. He is protecting that that author from error and making sure that the things that need to be said in Scripture are said. Now, sometimes people get the idea with inspiration that it is kind of a form of mechanical writing, uh, meaning that somehow, like uh, the you know the Apostle Paul sits down to write a letter to the Corinthian to the church in Corinth the Corinthians and he sits down and he says dear church in Corinth and then all of a sudden like the Holy Spirit gets a hold of him and, and gets done writing and he looks at what he's written and he says wow that's pretty good stuff uh, where'd that come from this is not what we mean by inspiration okay um, the Apostle Paul, as he is writing these letters, uh, his personality is not overwhelmed, it's not discarded, kicked to the curb by the Holy Spirit. It is actually Paul writing that letter. Um, we say that Scripture has two authors. It has a human author and it has a divine author. So Scripture has the human writer, the prophet, the apostle, so on, and it has the Holy Spirit, and, and both of them are actually the authors of Scripture. This is why when you compare, uh, let's say, Isaiah, who writes about 700 years before the Apostle Paul, a little more than that, actually, uh, when you compare Isaiah to the Apostle Paul, they don't sound anything like one another, and for good reason, because they're completely different people. And, and while the Holy Spirit is inspiring both authors, he is allowing them to write things in their own voice. Um, this is very important because um, when we talk, when we begin to interpret Scripture, one of the things that we have to take under consideration is we want to interpret this according to what the human author intended. First of all, before we we go on to spiritual interpretations, we have to understand what was the author's human uh, um, motivation for writing this. What is he trying to convey? Um, if we leave that out, then we are, we are quite frequently, almost always in my opinion, going to get off course of the proper interpretation of Scripture. So we have to take into consideration what the human author's intent was as he is writing. Um, in, in, this means it's hard work to interpret scripture. Uh, the Bible is an old book, and um, though I would say the truths that are conveyed in scripture are simple, they are conveyed in human language that is quite complex. And um, the distance, the cultural distance, the geographical distance, uh, the chronological distance that we uh, that stands between us and the Bible is quite significant. And so to try and and uh, get through all of these these uh, layers of history that separate us from the text requires a lot of work. Now, I would say the major themes of scripture are quite easy to understand. Uh, if you talk to my 5-year-old daughter about what the Bible says, she can tell you it tells me that Jesus loves me. And and she's right. That's what the Bible's about. But if I, you know, 
took her to Psalm 63 and begin to read it with her, she's not going to have a clue about what that means. So, it, the, the Bible, in some ways, is very easy to understand, I mean, the, the major themes, but when you really begin to uh, try and, and isolate some of these texts and, and really get into the heart of what they're trying to, to speak to us, um, you it's going to take some work. And this is why you will have to do this exegetical project later. I want you to, to have the experience of really attempting to get to know the biblical text and, and understand what the author was trying to say uh, when he wrote that. Um, the, these books of the Bible, they're written by these inspired authors. Uh, as I said, they were collected, first of all, by the synagogue, the, the Jewish people, for their worship, um, and then they were um, supplemented by the books in the New Testament by the early church. Um, we call this collection the canon. A uh, canon is a Greek word, it literally means a measuring stick, and it comes to refer to any kind of a list, uh, an ecclesiastical list, uh, a list of an official list, things that measure up, okay? And so the canon of Scripture are the books that measure up uh, to uh, the standards of the church, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the, this is something else that's important to point out, is we not only do we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the original authors of Scripture, we would maintain that that same Holy Spirit has guided the collection of these books into the canon, and he continues to inspire the church as she interprets these passages of Scripture. Um, the, I, I won't go into a lot of depth about how the Old Testament got to us. Uh, it was a very long process. It begins with the uh, Torah given to Moses. Um, that Torah is supplemented through the ages. Um, suffice it to say that um, at the around um, the fourth century or so BC, fifth, fourth century BC, the Old Testament, by and large, is completed. Um, th there will be a few other books that will be written. The Book of Daniel, for instance. Um, the books of Maccabees, we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but for the most part, the Torah, for sure, the, the five books of Moses, those have all um, been agreed upon as being God's Word. And they're being read every Saturday, every Sabbath, in the synagogue. Uh, there's a lectionary already at this point where uh, from week to week, the Jewish people come together and they read the Law of Moses. Uh, according to a particular uh, order, particular schedule. And they're also reading books of the prophets and um, kind of as a supplement to the Torah. So they're finding passages from the prophets that have something to do with the same themes, and they're reading them together in the synagogue. And then they're also uh, singing the, the Psalms. And uh, some of the other books, Song of Songs, for instance, will be chanted on Passover. Um, some of these, uh, the Book of Lamentations, they will sing on uh, when they commemorate the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians. So all these books are kind of compiled into a liturgical library. And this is very important. Um, it's Again, people don't have a Bible sitting on their shelf that they can take down and read at their leisure. And um, if they want to read the Bible, to study the Bible, they're going to have to go to the synagogue and read the copies that are there. No one has a personal copy of this book in their home. And different synagogues, we would believe, have different books in their libraries. Um, but over time, most of the synagogues have the same books in the library. There would be a few differences, maybe, uh, from place to place, but for the most part, they're all going to have the same books in their library. One of the things that happens is around 200 BC, uh, the king 
of Egypt named Ptolemy, Ptolemy II. He um, commissions a translation. This is according to legend. So this, we don't know that it happens exactly this way, but our oldest traditions about how we get the Greek Old Testament say that he commissions a translation of the Hebrew Torah, the, the Pentateuch, into Greek. And this gives us what we know today as the Septuagint. It's called the Septuagint. It's a, a, a Greek, uh, excuse me, a Latin word meaning 70 uh, because of a tradition of 70 scholars that come together and produce this translation. Um, eventually, so like I said, is, this starts with the Pentateuch, but it's not long before this Pentateuch is supplemented with the other writings of the Hebrew Bible, uh, the prophets and the Psalms and so on. And um, at this time, many of the Jewish people are not living in Palestine anymore. Some of them are living, there's a large population in, in Egypt, for instance, and the Jews who are living in Egypt all speak Greek uh, because the Greeks have conquered Egypt at that time. There are many Greeks living, excuse me, many Jews living in uh, Asia Minor, also speaking Greek. Uh, some are even living in Greece. And um, until the time of Christ, even after the Roman Empire uh, will take over what was the Greek Empire, uh, the lingua franca, the common language of the Roman Empire, will be Greek. And so all of the Jewish people who are dispersed all around the Roman Empire are going to be using Greek. What we find is that the synagogues who are using the Greek Bible, the Greek Old Testament, remember the New Testament has not yet been uh, compiled, hasn't been written. What we find is that the books in this Greek version of the Bible are a little, uh, the canon, to, it's a little anachronistic. They're not using that word yet, but but their library is a little bit more expansive than the Hebrew Bible. It has more books in it. Um, part of the reason is some of these books were actually written in Greek. For instance, there's a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, which we're quite certain was written in Greek. Um, but some of the other books, for instance, First Maccabees, uh, really seems to have been written in Hebrew, but it was shortly thereafter translated into Greek and becomes much more popular in Greek than it ever was in Hebrew. And so we get two different Old Testament canons. Scholar, scholars refer to these as the Alexandrian canon and the Palestinian canon. And um, they're not that different, but they're different enough that it's going to cause problems for us later in church history. Uh, because the Catholic Church... Um, has always accepted the broader Alexandrian canon, which includes seven more books and parts of a few others. Uh, it's uh, the Greek versions of Esther and Daniel, uh, which are a little different from the Hebrew versions. They're, they're, they're more expansive. So um, this is why the Catholic Bible is different from the Protestant Bible. It's not that the Catholic Bible added more books, uh, it's because the Catholic uh, Bible is keeping with this Greek tradition rather than the Palestinian tradition. Um, when the New Testament is, is written, well, that's something else that needs to be said, uh, I should have said this earlier probably, that uh, the Old Testament uh, was originally written in Hebrew and in Aramaic. Um, later, it's translated into Greek. When the New Testament is written, it is written from the get-go completely in Greek. Okay? So there are three languages, three holy languages that the scriptures are written in, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Mostly, there's very little in Aramaic, actually. Um, a large part of Daniel, and some of Ezra, and a few sentences here and there in Jeremiah and in uh, Genesis. But for the most part, Hebrew and Greek are the major languages of Scripture. At a much later time, um, a lot of times I ask students, what language was the Bible written in? And they'll all say Latin. And the reason they say that is because uh, at a much later date, uh, St. Jerome translates the Bible into Latin uh, 
And this becomes the official translation of the Catholic Church, known as the Vulgate, the common translation. But this is much later. This, um, it wasn't originally written in Latin. Uh, it was translated into Latin, and it becomes the official uh, Bible of the Catholic Church at that time. So, when the, the New Testament is written, it's written in Greek, and so when they're quoting the Old Testament, they are quoting the Greek it's Old Testament. It's 18 hours. Excuse me. So, uh, so when they quote the Old Testament, they're quoting the Old Testament. Sometimes they use a couple different versions, or sometimes they seem to generate their own version, their own translation. St. Paul does this a lot. His Hebrew and his Greek are very good. But for the most part, even St. Paul is going to quote the Septuagint, uh, because this is the Greek Old Testament of their day and age. And so the apostles and the early church seem to all recognize the Septuagint as being the official Bible of the church at that time. When you read, um, there, there are a couple of allusions, I would say, in the New Testament to the books of what uh, Catholics call the Deuterocanon, the second canon, and what Protestants often refer to as the Apocrypha. But um, many of these books are alluded to in the New Testament. So uh, I have here in my critical edition of the New Testament, um, it, it has all of the places in the Old Testament that are quoted in the New Testament, and it has, um, let's see, about four, five pages. Yeah, it has five pages of citations from the um, deuterocanonical books uh, that are in the New Testament. Um, when we now, now those are mostly allusions. They're not exactly quotes. Uh, it really quotes the other books of the Bible more. When you get to a little bit later date, uh, we have some writers who are called the Apostolic Fathers, and those guys uh, begin to quote the uh, the Deuterocanon Deuterocanonical books at length. Um, so, for instance, I'm thinking of a place where uh, First Clement, uh, he's a one of the early bishops of Rome before the end of the first century, actually, he refers to the book of Judith as though it's scripture. Uh, he talks about her in the, in the same breath as he mentions other great heroes of the Old Testament. And so this uh, conveys to us that he believes the book of Judith is scripture. Um, later, um, because of a dispute between Luther and the Catholic Church over purgatory and the intercession of the saints, which are referred to in the book of 2 Maccabees. Luther will say that those books are not actually part of the original canon, and he will go back to the Hebrew canon, the, book, the co collection of the books that are used not by Christians but by the Jews. Um, and so he will go back to their canon and say, this is the Bible, the deuterocanonical books, which he will term the Apocrypha, borrowing a, a term that was used by, by Jerome much earlier. He'll call those the Apocrypha, and he'll relegate them to an appendix to his Bible and say that they're not actually Scripture. Within a couple generations, uh, for instance, the, uh, the King James Bible, when it was first published in 1611, it did the same thing. It put the Apocrypha, as they called it, as an appendix to the Old Testament, but um, paper's kind of expensive in those days, and so it won't take long before they begin to just excise these books altogether and print Bibles without the Apocrypha. Uh, they don't consider them to be scripture, so why do we need to have them in the Bible? Um, the Catholic Church will continue to print them in their Bibles, though, because we do regard them as the inspired Word of God. Not a whole lot of difference, really, between our Bibles. Like I said, seven, bo seven books and parts of two others, and um, the contributions in those two books, in, in, excuse me, in those uh, seven books and the, the two portions, are not all that really significant. It's not like uh, they're... <laughs> There are some, like I said, in Second Maccabees, some re references to purgatory and to the intercession of the saints, but um, not major doctrinal 
differences that you would derive from those books. Um, one of the last things before I leave you, I want to talk about how is it that the church recognized these books as, of the New Testament in particular as canonical. And really, um, before we had an idea of the canon in the Orthodox Church, the Christian Church, um, there was a fellow named Marcion who kind of provoked us to form a canon because he created his own canon. Uh, Marcion was a heretic in the 2nd century, early 2nd century. Um, he had a lot of weird ideas, and among them he believed that the God of the Old Testament was actually Satan. Okay? Weird idea. Um, and he believed that the, he, he was kind of an anti-Semite. He believed that the Jews worshipped Satan. He believed that um, the God of the Old Testament, all of... Um, he kind of fell into that trap where it seems like the God of the Old Testament, he's mean and judgmental, whereas the God of the New Testament is kind and loving. Um, it's an oversimplification. Uh, I don't really have time to get into that a whole lot here. If you want to talk about this in the discussion boards, uh, we, you might bring it up there if you have some questions about that. But um, he, he really sees these as being two different kinds of gods. Um, moreover, like I said, he's, he's fairly anti-Semitic. He doesn't like the Jewish people. And so uh, there's plenty of Jewish stuff in the New Testament as well. And so he, uh, he basically says none of the Old Testament is inspired. He's, it's all, or it's inspired, but it's inspired by uh, Satan. So all of that is, is not um, actually canonical. And then he will say that the New Testament also has a lot of garbage in it. And so he will kind of begin to weed out what he thinks does not belong. So what he'll be left with in the end is part of Luke. He gets rid of all of the beginning of Luke because it's very Jewish. Anything dealing with the temple, for instance, um, he's going to get rid of that. And he will collect most of the epistles of Paul, but again, he will heavily edit them so that anything that seems to speak of the Old Testament or to quote the Old Testament, or to um, speak of the Jewish people with any kind of favorable tone at all, he's going to cut that out. And then he's going to say, this is the Bible. This is the canon. So he's the first one to really come up with a canon in the Christian church. Even um, the synagogue doesn't really come up with a canon before the church does. Uh, the synagogue has these books that they use in worship. They don't really come up with a list, per se. Um, Josephus, he lists the books, but he doesn't speak of them like in an authoritative way. He just says, these are the books that we use in our synagogue. And uh, when he's writing uh, the Antiquities of the Jews uh, for a Gentile, authorship, uh, Gentile readership, trying to explain to them what some of the Jewish customs are. Uh, but he doesn't decree this. He's not writing to Jewish people. He's just saying, if you went to a synagogue, these are the books that you'll hear being read. And that corresponds with the, the Palestinian canon that is in the Protestant Bible today. Um, returning to Marcion, he really is the first one to say, these are the books of the Bible, there are none other. Okay, Luke and some of Paul's epistles. The church then has to respond to Marcion. They have to say, no, this is wrong. Marcion, you cannot say this. You are a heretic. You are separating yourself from the Orthodox Church. And so in response, they are actually going to condemn him and to say, and to begin uh, coming up with their own lists of the New Testament. So uh, within that same century, um, contemporaries of Marcion, people like Irenaeus and Tertullian, um, they, they really speak about the Gospels more than any other books. They're going to say, the, the church does not have one gospel, we have four. And all four of these are um, from the Holy Spirit, and no more than four, because there were other gospels floating around as well. So they're going to start uh, thinking about what belongs in this new library 
that supplements the Old Testament. And they're going to use four criteria, and these are the criteria that they use. First of all, for a book to be in the New Testament, it has to be of apostolic origin. It has to be written by an apostle or an associate of the apostles, an apostolic person, sometimes we say. Um, this means a book of the Bible has to be old. Um, anything that comes after the apostles is not going to be recognized as scripture. This is part of the reason that Catholics uh, would reject, for instance, books like the Book of Mormon or the Quran. Uh, we would say, no, there is no more revelation to be given to us. Uh, it, it was summed up in Jesus, and it was established in his apostles, and when the last of the apostles, St. John, according to tradition, when he dies... There is nothing else to be written. Everything that can be said has been said. So we cannot add to the Bible. Uh, we're not going to get a fifth gospel. We're not going to get the New Testament part two. It, it's all been done. Uh, so anything that comes after the second century, it may be, um, it might be inspired like with a little eye inspiration. It might be helpful. It might be beneficial. But we're not going to say, oh, this is the Word of God in the same way that we will the biblical books. Uh, because it has to be from an apostle or somebody who was a contemporary, a, a disciple of the apostles. Uh, when Really, there are only a few of these in the New Testament. I'm thinking about a guy like Luke. So Luke is not an apostle, but he is the disciple of St. Paul, who is an apostle. Um, St. Mark, the same goes for him. Uh, the Gospel of Mark um, is really, according to tradition, the Gospel of St. Peter. So, um, these books get in there because they're kind of hanging on to the coattails of the apostles. But, uh, you know, somebody can't come up with a book today and say, I think this needs to get in there because it's pretty good. If it's not written by an apostle, it, it can't. Or, or somebody associated with the apostles, somebody who knew the apostles, it's not going to get into the Bible. The next criterion is it has to be Catholic. Um, not in the denominational use of the term, but in the original sense of being universal. Um, it has to be something that the church worldwide has accepted. Uh, so in that uh, first, second century, there were a lot of books going around, these Gnostic Gospels, for instance, where they claimed to have like um, an inside track on secret knowledge that was not dispersed all over the church. Well, the church fathers are going to say, no, that, that is not part of the authentic, inspired Word of God because it's not something that the church worldwide recognizes. Now, of course, in the second century, the worldwide church is a pretty small geographical uh, spread. We're talking about uh, the Holy Land, Egypt, and real, basically the Roman Empire, right? Um, but it had to have been accepted wherever there was an apostolic church. So wherever, so the church in Rome, and the church in Asia Minor, and the church in Jerusalem, and the church in Egypt. Th those are the four major uh, places where the church was really going at that time they all had to agree that these were the books that they had received from the apostles. Um, if, if one of them had a particular book that they liked, it might be very popular, it might be respected and even revered, but it's not going to be accepted as scripture. There's one very uh, famous example of this. There's a book called The Shepherd of Hermas, um, which was very, very popular. And it actually shows up in a few of the early canonical lists of the New Testament. Why is it not accepted? Because it wasn't read in Asia Minor. It wasn't read in, um, it doesn't seem to have been read in Jerusalem. Um, it was somewhat popular in Rome, where it was written, but it was especially popular in Egypt. But um, one major uh, seat of the church was not enough to make it scripture. It had to be accepted in all of them. Um, a book of the Bible had to be orthodox. It, it had to uh, agree with the rest of the teachings of sacred tradition. So if you had a book of the Bible, or a book that purported to be a book of the Bible, 
that didn't agree with another part of Scripture, then it's not going to make it into the canon. Again, there were a lot of books that claimed to be written by apostles, but when you begin to read them, they just seem weird. You know, they, they, they don't agree with the rest of the Bible. And so it, that's not going to be accepted as Scripture. And finally, um, this is one that we don't think about a lot today, but the Bible was actually compiled for worship. It was compiled to be used in a liturgical setting. And so for a book to be recognized by the early church as being canonical, it had to be a book that was used on a fairly regular basis in worship, in the liturgy. And if it's not used liturgically, then it's not going to be recognized as scripture. Those are the four criteria for the canon of the New Testament. Um, broadly speaking, they kind of uh, could be used for the Old Testament as well, although, as I have hinted at, that was a, a little bit different process by which those that library was collected. I look forward to seeing what you have to say in the uh, discussion boards. Uh, God bless you. Uh, read through those passages of Scripture that are outlined in the syllabus, and uh, we'll have a lot to talk about.